Good morning and welcome to MCC Toronto. We hope you'll experience God's presence and God's peace as we worship together this morning. Welcome to our service. And if this is your first time worshiping with us today, a particular welcome to you. And please know that everyone is invited to join us for coffee and refreshments in the social hall directly behind us through any of these four doors. And also, hello to the folks who are worshiping with us around the world from 105 countries on our webcast. Welcome. When you came in today, you received our wonderful connection card in your information packet, and we encourage everyone every week to complete the card and drop it in the offering plate and let us know that you're here. Our angels of the week this week are a team of folks who have been very, very busy over the last few days. MCC Toronto is one of the uh, depots for the Toronto Star uh, Christmas boxes that are delivered one of the largest in the city, just a little under 1,700 boxes this year distributed by the congregation. And the team is coordinated by two amazing women who have phenomenal organizational skills and a deep, deep commitment to making the world a better place. And so they have helped you sorting and organizing and delivering. And so we want to thank the team of folks who helped in any way whatsoever, led by uh, Romelda and Heather. Could all of you stand, please, if you've helped with the boxes? Also, Christmas Eve service at Roy Thompson Hall, we're getting closer and closer, um, and so we encourage you to get your tickets, we encourage you to buy tickets for friends, um, and uh, help us to make sure we have a good attendance on Christmas Eve, and that folks, it's a wonderful gift to give to someone, to bring them to the Christmas Eve service. There are also lots of inserts in your order of service of other ways that you can help us uh, with that service couple of changes to our usual way of doing things. Uh, The next two Sundays, uh, at the 11 o'clock service, there will not be children's church. So for the next two Sundays, there won't be. And also, uh, December the 30th, the last Sunday of the year, uh, we're taking the 9 o'clock service and the 11 o'clock service and combining them into one at 11 o'clock for that last Sunday, the 30th. An update on our construction, Uh, we believe that we have solved the issue of the river running underneath the building that we found, Um, and uh, that's been solved, Uh, and uh, so construction now has has continued, and uh, we're going to be later than we thought getting it done, but we're moving forward, and so the new uh, date for everything to be completed is February the 28th, so thank you again for your ongoing patience uh, as we do this exciting work uh, together. And now we have a Sunday commercial. Again this year, our church is having a big potluck turkey dinner on Christmas Day. You can read all about that on page three of your Sunday news. Every year, that dinner is getting bigger and better. We've put out a special welcome to the trans community. They love that our African, Caribbean, and Spanish groups, and to our refugee program. It means a lot to those of us who do not have family to celebrate with on Christmas Day. So it's a multicultural potluck, and all are welcome, with or without a special dish. That means you don't have to bring food, you don't have to have a partner with you either. (laughs) Um, So, So here's the thing, even if 150 dinner guests show up this year, we are committed to having enough food for every single person. Already, people who aren't even joining us for dinner have let us know they'll be dropping off dishes and baked goods, and after, um, well, I'll tell you that in a minute. So that's big when people are volunteering that way. So here's the really big thing. We need more turkeys this year. And especially more cooks to stuff and roast turkeys. After the nine o'clock, I got uh, a cook who will do two turkeys. So we're, we're moving along. So whether you want to attend, volunteer, or donate toward that dinner, and especially if you are willing to be a turkey roaster, Sign up today at, in the social hall. There's a table uh, next to the kitchen. Um, 
I know it's crowded in the social hall sometimes, so just look for the big turkey sign. <laughs> Thank you. And right now we have our one minute celebration opportunities for you to name something that you're celebrating. We ask you please to hold your applause till the end so we can treat everybody equally. Vacation, birthday, and a new employer in January. Let's join, sorry, yay, let's join together to celebrate all the folks who are celebrating. <laughs> we invite you now to rise as you're able, introduce yourselves, extend a hand of friendship. Right. 
come to you today in the midst of a world in mourning. We come to you today to lift up the souls who are tearful. But we also come to you today in celebration, in joyful times, in Advent, in anticipation of the arrival of the biggest gift there is. Knowing that we are together to hold each other up, to go forth to do your work. Amen. Sing this night, for a boy is born in Bethlehem, Christ our Lord in a lowly nature lies. Bring your gifts, come and worship at his cradle, hurry to Bethlehem and see the Son of Mary. See his star shining bright in the sky this Christmas night, follow Hurry to Bethlehem and see the Son of Mary. Angels bright come from heaven's highest glory. Bear the news with this message of good cheer. Sing rejoice to save us. Hurry to Bethlehem and see the Son of Mary. See his star shining bright in the sky this Christmas night. Follow me joyfully. Hurry to Bethlehem and see the Son of Mary. night follow me joyfully hurry to Bethlehem and see the son of Mary let us all pay our homage at the manger sing his praise on this joyful Christmas night Christ is come bringing promise of salvation hurry to Bethlehem See the Son of Mary. See his star shining bright in the sky this Christmas night. Follow me joyfully. Hurry to Bethlehem and see the Son of Mary. Hurry to Bethlehem. This morning, before we begin the prayers of the people, we're going to take a few moments of reflection and prayer as we remember uh, the families in Connecticut um, today. I can't imagine the horror of a parent hearing news and then trying to frantically find out whether their child is alive or not, or someone whose mom or dad is a teacher in the school and trying to find out if their loved one is still alive or not. I can't imagine that horror. Today we think of lives lost, we think of innocence lost, we think of the turmoil in little children's minds who survived about what this is all about. I know that many families that night spend a little extra time with their kids to be able to hug the people close to us. And it is a stark reminder for all of us that the gift of life is a wonderful gift, a precious gift, and a fragile gift and that we are to hold close those who are part of our circle. And so today I ask you to be prayerful for uh, the families, all families involved. But I also ask you to 
be thoughtful and prayerful about what has to change. What we need to do differently as a society. So this isn't repeated again and again and again. And so before Randy leads us all in prayers for our prayers of the people, I'd like for us to just take a moment or two now uh, and pray together. God, we think of those families. Of their pain and anguish. And God, we ask your blessing upon them that they would be surrounded by love and support. And God, we ask your blessing on the kids who survived and the teachers who survived. And all of the questions that so many children will have for their families and for their teachers in the coming days. And as we remember and as we mourn, may we also be committed to the transformation of our world to be a better and safer place. For we ask this in your many names. Amen. Gracious God, your abundance surrounds us and sustains us. We thank you for gifts of friendship and new beginnings, for life as it unfolds and new opportunities for growth. Prayer request on the connection cards. God of grace, Spirit of hope in our lives and in our world, there are many troubled by concerns. Some face the uncertainty and pain of illness. Some wrestle with anxiety and fear about work, about relationships, and about themselves. We pray that your healing love may touch these lives. Randy Teeple, the people of the state of Connecticut. God of hope, we know you hear our prayers. Spirit of compassion, be with us as we face losses in our lives. Where there is disappointment, lead us to joy. Where there is grief, fill us with your peace. Where there is death, Help us to say goodbye for now and not forever. We pray for families of those who lost loved ones in the recent shootings. Crises around the world. God of compassion. breath of the universe. You have created us for joy. Open our minds to the gracious promptings of your spirit. Increase our trust and guide our hearts in the ways of the truth. God of many names, you transform us by grace and renew us in peace. sacred reading. Rejoice in God always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. God is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you.
the crowds asked John the Baptist, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. These are sacred readings. May they comfort us, inspire us, and challenge us. Thanks be to God. sermon series during these four Sundays of Advent have been about how to transform our lives. I'm sure all of us would say there's some things we want to change. We'd like some things to be different in our lives. Well, how does that happen? How do we make that happen? The first Sunday we took a look at preparation. Last Sunday we took a look at enlightenment. And if you missed those, they're on the web. You can catch up. And today we take a look at reflection. I know that different Christian traditions have different ways of approaching this, and the one I was raised in, uh, reflection usually meant groveling. It usually meant uh, being very careful to remember every single sin that you did wrong. Now, when I uh, was raised in this strict fundamentalist tradition, I, as a little kid, I almost walked around with a pen and paper to make sure I wrote down every bad thing I did. Um, I think subsequently God invented computers so I could keep up with it. But uh, to write down everything that I did wrong just to make sure I confessed it. Because if I didn't confess it, then there would be that one thing that would stick out that God would uh, judge me on. Can you imagine the fear of a little kid being so afraid to miss something that they did wrong? Now the church also taught me to make sure I tithed on every piece of income. So whenever I got some money for an allowance or money for birthday, I had to write it down to make sure I didn't miss that 10%. Now, I would encourage you in that one. That probably is, <laughs> is, is something that you, you might want to think about. Reflection can be viewed another way, though. And I think the Christian tradition at its best would take the concept of confession and repentance differently than what I was raised. Confession is about naming those things that need to change. And I think God is much more concerned about the patterns of our lives that need to change rather than the one-off mistakes that we make. And so confession is reflecting on that and naming that to God. And then repentance is about a change of direction, deciding that you're going to do it differently. And as you reflect on your life and you notice some changes, I would also encourage you to notice those patterns in your lives that are working for you things that contribute to your health and to your wholeness and to make sure you invest in those things. And it's also important, the questions that we ask. Very important, the questions we ask ourselves. When someone does something to hurt us, instead of saying, why did that person do that? Yes, it's going to be a natural reaction at first to wonder that. But I would encourage you to shift the question to why is it I'm reacting to what they said? Why is that getting to me? 
Viktor Frankl in his research through his own experience in the concentration camp and his research as a psychiatrist developed a brand of therapy called logotherapy and in logotherapy he says that we are not responsible for the things that happen to us but we are responsible to our, for our reaction to those things and between everything that happens to us and our reaction there's a gap when we decide how we're going to respond and I'm again not talking about that kind of knee-jerk ouch that hurt or knee-jerk we're angry about an injustice but then what is it we think about dwell on what are the questions we ask after that initial reaction so this morning I want us to take a look at the two scriptures and there are four questions that I think might be helpful for each of us as we look at our lives and how we want our lives to change. The first, the crowd said to John the Baptist, what are we to do? I think that raises a question for us, for each one of us. How can we make a difference in our world? Now some of you are blessed by the jobs that you have. For some of you, your job is your calling. And you see how through your work, you are able to make a difference in the world. Teachers, many, uh, most of the teachers that I know of, it's their calling. They're called to do this. And they see how they can make a difference in the world. Others of you have professions where that is the case. But not everyone. Other folks, the job is just a way to pay the bills. And so some of those folks then look to their volunteer area for where they can really make a difference and contribute. Gandhi said that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. The best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Some of you are making a difference in our world by how you raise your families. That you are determined to bring your kids up in such a way that they will be a gift, a contribution to society. Others of us are also choosing to make a difference through the building of MCC Toronto as a place of transformation and as an instrument of transformation in our world. Almost all of us are making a difference by paying our taxes. Our taxes are a way that we contribute to the greater good, a way that we care for our neighbors a way that we are able, if we are blessed with income, to be able to be taxed on that income and to add it to the pool to creating a better quality of life for our society. And all of us can make a difference in the world by how we speak up on social justice issues. You can't make comments or know about every issue, but there are some that you can and need to. Now the wonderful thing about this church is the diversity that exists here. And so no matter what issue we talk about, there's a difference of opinion. But I'm preaching and I get to give you my opinion. I see absolutely no reason why anyone should own a handgun or any form of gun in a city. I understand in rural communities where farmers may need a rifle or protection for them or for their animals. I understand that, right? Uh, but I do not see the justification in uh, city areas for guns to be owned. And I hope that uh, if this is an issue that you can be passionate about, that you can speak up about, this is one of the ways for us to turn tragedies uh, into changing our society uh, and making sure that we don't go backwards after we have made changes um, in society. So one of those questions is, how can I make a difference? Continually asking ourselves. Secondly, the tax collectors went to John the Baptist and said, what are we to do? The way tax collecting worked in those days is tax collectors were given a certain area that they were able to collect taxes. And they were given an assessment. You have to collect this much tax. And everything above that assessment you get to keep. And so that meant there was a lot of abuses in the system. That people were extorting money from people, being unfair with people, so they could get more and more money to keep for themselves. Some might uh, call it contracting out. 
and the potential abuses that can come to that when there isn't societal oversight in the way that it should be. And so I think a question that might come to us is how can we be more honest? How can we be more fair in our relationships with others? Certainly we can hold account our governments in terms of being good stewards of every penny that is entrusted to their care in terms of honesty and fairness. Certainly in terms of your church holding the board and the staff of your church accountable for every penny entrusted to our care to be honest and to be fair with that. The good news is the auditors continue to say we are doing a good job. In terms of your relationship with your employer being more honest. In terms of your relationship to people who work with you or for you being more honest and being more fair. And in terms of paying your taxes being more honest when you complete the tax form so that we have more resources to care for more people. How can I make a difference? How can I be more honest or more fair? The soldiers came to John the Baptist and they said, what can we do? And I think there we are reminded of how we use our power. How can we use our power more justly? Now you may say that you don't have any power and I would challenge you that you do. Primarily we all have the power of the spoken word. The power that we have to lift someone up or to tear them down. The power that we have to forgive or hold grudges. The power that we have to lovingly say I don't agree or to rip someone apart when they make a decision that we don't like. We all have the power of the word to lift up or to tear down. We all have power in terms of the circle we create around us. Who we include in that circle to be a part of that circle and who we exclude from the circle. The power to give or withhold forgiveness. The privilege that comes in our society. Some of us, for instance, those of us who are white males, that brings with it privilege in our society. We need to be aware of it and conscious of not abusing it. The power that parents have over children. Recently the state of California passed a law outbanning, ban, outlawing reparative therapy in that state for children. Reparative therapy is that so-called therapy where people try to change young gay lesbian kids into being heterosexual. And every major um, association says that's wrong and it does major damage and California outlawed it for children. And as a result, some folks have said that's um, infringing on parental rights. Well, parents don't have rights to abuse their children. And it is right for us as a society to be intervening and to make sure that children are being properly and safely cared for. How do you use your power? And finally, in the reading from the book of Philippians, asking yourself the question what do you dwell on you know I'm a natterer if you don't believe I could have that flaw ask John okay I'm a natterer when things bug me and uh, if in my head it's natter 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 and then occasionally they come out you know and stuff and I'm challenged by the scripture finally friends whatever is true whatever is honorable or just, or pure, or pleasing, or commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. We have that choice. Yes, I'm not talking again about the knee-jerk hurt or the knee-jerk reaction of anger that comes immediately in a situation. I'm talking about then what do we dwell on as we move forward. And we are challenged to dwell on those things that are uplifting and encouraging. And even in those moments of grief, while we're grieving the loss, celebrating the gift that was. It has been so amazing in the last few hours to hear some of the parents in Connecticut talk about how wonderful their kids were and to be able to focus on that wonderful, wonderful gift that they were given even if it was so short a gift. Let your mind dwell on these things. The Bible says, as a person thinketh, 
so shall they be. As you think or natter, that is what you become. And some of us are so stuck on dwelling on the things that are wrong or hurtful or painful or things that we're afraid of. And that's what we're becoming. Instead of focusing, and I'm not asking you to, to ignore the challenges. You know, I have a little s slogan on my wall in the office. Dwell on the positives while dealing with the negatives. You've got to do both. But you can dwell on the positives while dealing with the negatives. So if you want to transform your life, a key part of that is reflection. Looking at the patterns in your life that need to change and asking yourself some good questions. How am I to make a difference today? How can I be more honest and more fair? How do I use my power and do I do it appropriately? And what is it that I dwell on as I go through my day? May you be blessed with the ability and the determination to transform your life, to do it differently. Amen. showed us a way to a relationship with God, freeing us from whatever binds us, reconciling us with God, with each other, and with ourselves. And so we pray, God, your grace liberates us from the past, frees us from sadness, releases us from guilt. Your love inspires us to sing a new song, as we embrace the beauty within us, in others, and in you. We open our hearts again to the renewal, the forgiveness, and the freedom you offer. Hear the good news. God saying to us, Behold, I make all things new. In every moment you are loved, and so you are forgiven, free in the name of God who created you, who dwells within you, and who goes with you always. Amen. Please feel free to come forward to receive anointing for healing.
offertory for this this morning with her amazing, amazing voice. Um, I would like for you to be mindful as you're hearing this song of, of other meanings than just the obvious meaning. To be mindful of not only parents in Connecticut, but in other parts of the world, whether it be war or famine or other things we can change. And be mindful of babies and families and parents in all of those situations uh, during this song. If you've been around MCC Toronto for a few years, you'll know that financial challenges have often been a companion we travel with. And that's not because we're bad managers of the resources, far from it. It's frankly because we are so aware of the needs and we want to do more and want to do more. and We want to stretch ourselves to start more programs, to care for more people, etc. And so I think it's a good thing that we constantly stretch ourselves. However, over the years, there have been times when we've stretched ourselves, and at the end of the year, we have a little bit of a debt. ten or $15,000. Not a big issue when you think of the size of our budget. And then the next year, if we have a little bit of a debt, then the next year we have a little bit of a debt, it adds up. And so over the years, every once in a while, we've had to come to you and say, crisis, crisis, and one of the frequent responses we've got from you has been, why did you wait until it was a crisis to tell us about it? And so this morning I'm being proactive. <laughs> We're not going to wait until it's a crisis. Next year is going to be a challenging year for us budgeting. 
Uh, we've started some new programs that we are absolutely committed to based on some special donations. The, the large donation we received a couple of years ago, that's starting to wind down. And we anticipate growth and that growth being allowing us to continue on with those programs. And so that's going to be a bit of a challenge this year as we budget to make sure that we're able to maintain those programs. We cannot take a deficit into next year. We cannot do that at the same time, cover a deficit. If you notice in your Sunday news, we are about $19,000 behind in offerings to this point. Not a major panic. We've been along all during the year. We saw this coming as we looked at offerings. We were able to cut back in some areas and manage that. So, you know, we'll probably be okay around that. But as of last Sunday, we were $39,000 short of our year-end mittens and match campaign. And that we cannot carry uh, into the new year with the budgeting situation. And so this morning we come to you and, and ask you if you've not already given or even if you have and you can give a little more, whatever you can do. Um, we know that some of the folks who normally help with this campaign can't this year because they've generously given to other campaigns. And we really appreciate that generosity. We also know that some folks can't because it's been a very tough year for them. And so others of us uh, have to step up. We're very thankful for a core of individuals who are our match donors, Michael Ball, Brian Berg and, uh, sorry, Brad Berg and Brian Rolfus, William Graham, the Honorable Bill Graham, Teresa Harvey and Janet Ridley, Mary Lou Mayer, the Samuel Sanford family, Stephen Waterage, Alan Rowe and Brian Blinken, and one anonymous don donor. And this morning after the service, uh, someone came up to, to also contribute $5,000 to be uh, one of the match donors. However, the total, we're about... Um, $31,000, take off that five, $26,000 now, uh, short of reaching our goal for uh, the end of the year. And so this morning I would ask you to be as generous uh, as you are able to uh, by putting it in the offering plate, uh, the, the yellow envelope, the special envelope gives you the opportunity to put it on your credit card if you want. Um, or if you need to think about it a little bit and you want to see me or one of us after the service uh, and give it to us, then that's fine as well. And I want to speak for a moment to our web congregation. Um, this is an opportunity for you also to be able to help. And the screen shows you how you can do that. You don't even need to tune out the rest of the service. Uh, that you can go to that little dot um, on your screen and you will be able to make a donation there uh, to help us no matter where you are around the world. This is something we can do together. Uh, that we can end this year in a healthy position as we move into next year. Uh, I am so thankful for a congregation that's willing to stretch so that we can do as much as we can to transform our world. I'm so thankful for your generosity. We are an extremely generous congregation and we th are thankful for the work that we can do together. The world still needs to be transformed. We invite the ushers to come forward as we receive our regular offering, our special offering, and our connection cards. of our abundance to your work in this community and from this community. Your love frees us to be generous with each other and inspires us to action 
as we build bridges in this place and from this place to a world hungry for hope, for justice, for safety, and for peace. And so we commission these gifts to your service in the world. Amen. God is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to our God. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, loving God, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with all the company of heaven who forever sing to proclaim the glory of your name.
These are the gifts of God, and we are the people of God. All are welcome to come and receive.
engage your gifts, who you are, your experience, in order to be transformed. So go from this place to heal our world. And as you go, go knowing that God's blessings go before you, that God's face will shine upon you and be gracious unto you, and that God will grant you peace. And you're going out and in your coming in, and you're lying down and in your rising up, in your labor, in your leisure, in your laughter, and in your tears. Until that day in which there is no dawning and no sunset, no death and no disease. For now rejoicing that God loves you. Amen. refreshments in the social hall through any of these four doors directly behind us. There's some extra food there today. Prime timers had a party yesterday. There's lots of food left over so they brought it in for us. So come and have some munchies with us. You can shop until you drop inside. You can buy choir CDs for Christmas presents. You can buy some clothes, 50% which goes to our year-end match. Um, lots of things that you can do in there during the social hall. The slide will tell you a few of those things. <laughs> Tonight is a very special service in our church. Uh, we do this every year, the Sunday close to Christmas. Uh, we call Blue Christmas. Um, and I'm right. I guess tonight. Yes. Thank you. Um, and it's the time for us to focus on the fact that Christmas is not uh, necessarily a happy or exciting time for many people who have gone through a difficult year. And so that tonight helps with that. And if you know someone who's been in the midst of some real challenges of late, think about bringing them tonight. Uh, for the Blue Christmas service. T next Sunday we conclude our sermon series on transforming your life. We hope to see you again. Let's join together and sing our closing song. Mm -hmm. <coughs>